stories yeah and i give away sheet music on my blog soundsofmyheart.net history is about events march 17 2010 <clears throat> something happened on that day that radically changed my life it happened in a hospital in maine i was there in the room as it was happening it changed my identity who i am on that day i became a grandmother now, you weren't there. What would convince you that I'm telling the truth? The post I made on Facebook as I was packing my suitcase to go to Maine? No. The lullaby I composed for my granddaughter and uploaded to my YouTube channel? What about the blog I wrote about her favorite doll and posted on her sixth birthday? Or the sheet music of songs I wrote for her and pinned on Pinterest? Well, Facebook posts, photographs, my blog, original songs on my YouTube channel, and sheet music and Pinterest, these are source material that you could study and authenticate, that is, confirm that I wrote them and when. Then you could ask, what is the best explanation for this material? Am I really Sarah's grandmother? Now, almost 2,000 years ago, a spectacular life-changing event occurred. It changed the identity of those who witnessed it, who were there when it happened. The historical records claim that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and then rose from the dead. We can study and authenticate source material from 2,000 years ago. That's what historians and critical scholars do. Today, we're going to look at three kinds of very ancient source materials. A creed that was re recited before the New Testament was written a hymn that was sung before the New Testament was written, the gospel accounts when they were written and their reliability. And then we'll ask, based on ancient source material, what facts do historians and critical, critical scholars consider historical? What is the best explanation for those facts? Now, according to the Apostle John, this happened the Sunday after Jesus was crucified and buried. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Can we believe this? Did he really rise? What do historians and critical scholars say? It's possible to believe parts of John's gospel and deny the resurrection. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. From 2004 to 2013, I was part of an online composers forum. I shared songs I had written, listened to music other composers wrote, and corresponded with some of them. Ralph Gardner had written an oratorio, setting the dialogue found in the Gospel of John to music. Ralph's narrative songs of Jesus' arrest, trial, and death were riveting. But his oratorio was incomplete. He left out the incident I just quoted. In fact, his oratorio had no narrative songs about Jesus' resurrection. He didn't believe that the creator God of the universe became a man, died on a cross, and physically rose from the dead. Now, the words on the screen are not from the Gospel of, of John, but they offer proof that what John wrote is true. The words are embedded in the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 15. They come from the Corinthian Creed or the Gospel Creed. 1 Corinthians 15 teaches that Christianity hinges on Jesus' resurrection. Paul says that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Christianity is a lie. It is not worth believing. What you are about to hear is my musical response to Ralph's oratorio. You'll need to watch the screen closely to read the lyrics as a song is playing.
It's not a typo that the creed can be dated four to six years or even months after Jesus died. Richard Carrier has a doctorate in ancient history. He does not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. In his August 10th, 2016 blog, he, he responded to a question he frequently gets asked about the date for the creed. This is the question. I keep hearing Christian apologists insisting the Corinthian Creed, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, can be reliably dated to the 30s AD, just years or even months after Jesus died. Can you direct me to a solid refutation of that claim? His response, the answer is no, because there is no refutation of this claim. The evidence for this creed dating to the very origin of the religion is amply strong. Now, he's not the only skeptic who dates the creed this early. <clears throat> Neither Carrier, Gerd Ludemann, nor Robert Funk believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Yet all three say the creed was developed within three years of Jesus' death. Why? Well, scholars consider an ancient document to be authentic if the author is named and there is a historical setting to attach a date to. So based on these two criteria, skeptical, liberal, and conservative scholars consider these letters written by Paul as authentic. Romans, <clears throat> First Corinthians that, con that contains the creed, Second Corinthians, Galatians that they use to date the creed, Philippians, it contains the hymn, First Thessalonians. In history, minor discrepancies do not invalidate authenticity. They provide an argument against collusion. Here are just three examples of discrepancies. The details differ, yet no one doubts that the events are historical. Here's a timeline developed by one skeptical New Testament scholar. It's based on ancient documents that scholars consider authentic and an archaeological find, an inscription chiseled in stone and found in Delphi. This timeline dates Paul's conversion three years after Jesus' death, and it puts um, Paul in Jerusalem visiting Peter six years as, after Jesus' death and then 14 years after that. And it places Paul in Corinth, at the same time that Gallia was there as governor of Acacia. Now, Paul included the creed in his letter to the church at, at, at Corinth. Let's look at the creed in detail. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen to sleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Now, scholars tell us that the text of 1 Corinthians 15 is stable from manuscript to manuscript, delivered and received. They're technical language that the rabbis used for transmitting sacred tradition. In fact, Paul used these terms earlier when he discussed communion. Paul received the church. He delivered it to the church at Corinth. Now it has the grammatical structure of a creed. There's a stylized format using parallelism to aid memorization. There's a fourfold pattern using that. There's death, burial, resurrection, and appearances. Scholars tell us that the language is not typical of Paul. For our sins, according to the scriptures, the third day, the twelve are uncommon in Paul's writings. It uses Peter's Aramaic, not Greek name. Cephas supports an early origin. When did Paul receive the creed? There are three possibilities, but no matter which one you choose, the creed would have existed before Paul received it. Now, Paul could have received it as early as three years after Jesus' resurrection. The thinking goes like this. <clears throat> Paul was a wild man ravaging the church in Jerusalem. He entered house after house, dragging out men and women and committing them to prison. He may have heard the creed in passing as he was arresting believers. But three years later, 
When Paul was baptized, he was catechized or formally taught using the creed. He could have received it in Antioch <clears throat> as late as 12 years after Jesus' resurrection. The creed uses the Greek word Christ. Believers were first called Christians in Antioch, and Paul spent time there preaching the gospel. Most scholars favor six years after the resurrection when he discussed the gospel with Peter. Now, does this contradict Galatians, where Paul says he wasn't taught the gospel, he didn't receive it from man, but from Jesus? Well, I didn't need to be taught that my granddaughter was born March 17, 2010. I was there, but I wanted others to know. So I announced it on, on Facebook, and Facebook timestamped my announcement. My announcement was a stylized proclamation of the fact of her birth. Now, the gospel is the historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul didn't need to be taught the fact. He experienced it on the road to Damascus. He experienced the risen Christ. Paul was not taught the gospel. He was taught the creed. The creed is a stylized proclamation of the fact. Now, scholars have good reasons for believing Paul received the creed from Peter six years after Jesus' resurrection. Fifty days after Jesus' resurrection, Peter preached a lengthy sermon. On the left will be a, a, a summary of Peter's sermon. The creed will be on the right. Let's compare them. Peter said, God made Jesus both Lord and Christ, that Jesus died by crucifixion, that forgiveness of sins is found in the name of Jesus, that Jesus' death was according to God's set purpose and foreknowledge. He said Jesus was not abandoned in the grave, that God raised Jesus to life. He said Jesus' body would not see decay, and this fulfilled scripture. Peter claimed that he and the disciples were witnesses. Now, six years after Peter's sermon at Pentecost, Paul came to visit him. Peter's message was the same. In fact, every time Peter spoke about Jesus, he gave the same message. This chart compares the creed with all of Peter's speeches and acts. The creed lists nine facts. Acts 2 is Peter's Pentecost sermon to the Jews. Acts 3 is his speech to the crowd at the temple who saw the lame beggar healed. It has seven of the nine. Acts 4 is his defense before rulers, elders, and teachers of the law. It has seven of the nine. Acts 10 is the sermon to the Gentiles assembled in Cornelius' home. It has eight of the nine. We can see that the creed is indeed a stylized summary of Peter's speeches. Now we can timestamp the creed to within months of the resurrection. The Corinthian creed is not the only creed that predates the writings of the New Testament. Scholars have identified nine creeds that were being recited before any of the New Testament documents were written. written. They've identified four hymns that were being sung before any of the New Testament had been written. I've written several songs for my granddaughter. In fact, three months before she was born, I wrote her a lullaby. I burned the music to a CD and mailed it to her parents. The primitive church composed songs about Jesus. Let's look at the Philippian hymn, a hymn that agrees with the creed. Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Bart Erdman is an atheist New Testament scholar and author of several books debunking Christianity. He does not believe Jesus rose from the dead. He also does not think this passage is a hymn, but he is convinced the passage predates Paul. In his blog, he writes, quote, The first and most important thing is that it has been widely recognized by scholars 
for a very long time that this passage is something that Paul appears to be quoting, that it is not simply part of the prose letter. The reasons for thinking that Paul is quoting rather than composing it are pretty compelling. End quote. Here's a passage put to song. Be sure to watch the screen closely for the lyrics. We could develop a timeline for the hymn. God used jail and an earthquake to build his church in Philippi. Paul and Silas were in jail. At midnight, they were singing hymns of praise. There was an earthquake and all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains were loosened. The jailer woke up and saw that the prison doors were open and he was about to kill himself. Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer and his household became believers. They were the church at Philippi. Ten years later, Paul wrote to them from a prison in Rome. He quoted a hymn. What hymn do you think Paul quoted? The one that birthed their church? Where did Paul learn the hymn? The hymn claims Jesus Christ is Lord. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. There were Greek-speaking believers in Antioch. And, in fact, Antioch is the, is the city where believers are first called Christians, and, and Paul spent a year there preaching the gospel. So he probably sang the hymn when he was in Antioch. That would place the hymn to within 12 years of Jesus' death. From the creed and hymn, we know that the primitive church believed that Jesus is God. He died for our sins, and his resurrection is proof. They believed this before Paul wrote any of his letters. They believed this before the Gospels were written. What about the Gospels? Well, literary analysis and source criticism of the Synoptic Gospels are used by critical scholars to develop theories on how and why Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written. Their theories don't agree. Conflicting theories are useless in developing a timeline for the Gospels. Critical scholars do agree that Greco-Roman historians favored eyewitness testimony over written records. The Gospels reflect that preference. We'll use eyewitness testimony and historical facts to develop a timeline for the Gospels. Now, the solar eclipse of August 12, 21, 2017 is a historical fact. I was an eyewitness of the fact. 
In fact, I got a great photo of it with my iPhone and posted that photo on, on Facebook. Check my timeline. I have photos of my granddaughter time stepped before my photo of the eclipse. She came first. Peter may have been executed in AD 64 at the time of the great fire in Rome. Paul was executed in AD 68 under Nero's orders. Jerusalem, the temple, and the sheep gate were all destroyed in 70 AD. Now, the Gospel of Matthew contains more than 130 Old Testament quotes and allusions showing that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Matthew is filled with fulfilled prophecy. Matthew also includes predictions that Jesus made. He records that Jesus' disciples wanted to take him on a tour of the temple buildings. And Jesus replied, all these buildings will be knocked down, not one stone left on top of another. This is an amazing prophecy that the temple, the most important building to the Jews, would be destroyed. Why doesn't Matthew mention it? When it was fulfilled, that was fulfilled. Mark doesn't mention it either. And Mark does not mention the execution of Peter. Luke, a companion of Paul, does not mention Paul's execution or the destruction of the temple. And John records that the sheep gate in Jerusalem was in existence at the time he wrote his gospel. I think we can timestamp the gospels. They were most likely written before 70 AD, before Jerusalem, the temple, and the sheep gate were destroyed. They were written within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses. All four proclaimed that Jesus' tomb was empty and he rose from the dead. The Synoptic Gospels report that the women found the stone rolled away and the tomb empty. They were told Jesus was not there, that he had risen. They entered the tomb. They did not find the body. If you look at the list of women, it varies from account to account. Recall that in history, minor discrepancies do not invalidate authenticity. They provide an argument against collusion. John reports that the men ran to the tomb, entered it, and found the burial cloths, but not Jesus. When John saw how the burial linen was arranged, he believed. The Gospels claim to be eyewitness testimony. Can we believe them? Are they trustworthy? In part one of her book, Dr. Lydia McGrew lists 27 undesigned coincidences in the Gospels that are hidden in plain view. The, the coincidences are difficult to fake, unlikely to come about by chance, and, and create an aha moment. Now, you might puzzle over some of my Facebook posts about my granddaughter, but if you saw a photo or a, a post on her parents' timeline, you would go, yep, I get it now. McGrew found nine times where the Synoptic Gospels explain John. Both John and Luke describe the Last Supper. John tells us that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Why did Jesus do that? Aha. Uh -huh. Luke tells us why. During dinner, the disciples started to argue who among them was the greatest. How did Jesus handle that? Luke tells us what Jesus said. The greatest is the one who serves. John tells us what Jesus did. He washed his disciples' feet. McGrew lists six times where John explains the synoptic gospels. Mark 6 tells us that at the time when Jesus fed the 5,000 people, many were coming and going. Why were many coming and going? John tells us the Passover was at hand. I get it. The Jews would have been on the roads in large numbers. McGrew lists four times when the Synoptic Gospels explain each other. Why, why does Matthew list the disciples in pairs? Mark tells us Jesus sent out the disciples in pairs. Now Matthew makes sense. McGrew lists eight other undesigned coincidences in the, in the Gospels. For instance, John tells us that before feeding the 5,000, Jesus asked Philip where to buy bread. Why Philip? Well, by putting together Matthew and Luke, we learn that Jesus fed the 5,000 
near the town of Bethsaida. In a different passage of John, we learn that Philip was from Bethsaida. Between 1975 and 2005, critical scholars published about 3,400 papers on the resurrection in the French, German, and English languages. Now, what facts surrounding the resurrection do most critical scholars consider historical? Well, from their published papers, we can compile a list of the facts they consider historical. Our facts must satisfy two criteria. They are supported by multiple independent sources, and they are accepted as historical by skeptical, liberal, and conservative scholars. This is called the minimal facts approach to the resurrection. Most critical scholars accept these 12 facts as being historical. We've explored eight of them, the ones in red. Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona expand on five of them. In their book, Habermas and Lacona go into great detail on four facts that over 90% of critical scholars accept as historical, plus one other fact. Fact number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. They cite five ancient non-Christian sources that support this. Fact number two, Jesus' disciples believed that he rose and appeared to them. Now we have oral traditions that pre predates the, the New Testament. We have five creeds from Pauline letters that are considered authentic and one hymn from a Pauline letter that is considered authentic. Then we have the written tradition, the eyewitness accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and John. And then the apostolic fathers also We've written accounts from them. That would be Clement and Polypart. And the disciples lived at seven ancient sources attest to their willingness to suffer and die for their claim. Fact number three, the church persecutor, Paul, was suddenly changed. Fact number four, the skeptic, James, the brother of Jesus, was suddenly changed. Plus one fact, the tomb was empty. This is the most contested fact. Even so, 90 or even so, 75% of scholars writing on the subject between 1975 and 2005 accept the empty tomb as historical fact. We tend to think that the debate about the resurrection is between scholars who deny it and scholars who believe it. The, the debate is really between unbelieving scholars and the eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. This eyewitness account comes from Mark. Jesus stood before Pilate and acknowledged that he was the king of the Jews. Pilate handed Jesus over to the soldiers to be flogged and crucified. They beat him. They put a purple robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. They mocked him, calling out, Hail, king of the Jews. Then they took off the purple robe put his own clothes on him and led him out and crucified him. They placed a written notice of the charge against him that read, the king of the Jews. When the centurion saw how Jesus died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Jesus was buried in a tomb cut from rock and a stone was rolled against the entrance of the tomb. When the Sabbath was over, the women who saw where he was laid went to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. They found the stone to the entrance of the tomb rolled away and a young man dressed in a white robe next to the tomb. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. What will you do with this eyewitness testimony?
What will you do with the historical evidence? What will you do with Jesus? Thank you, Kathy. Uh, why don't we have a type of Q&A right now? Can it, anybody online uh, have any questions or anybody here in the room? <clears throat> Go ahead. Well, you know, I just <clears throat> wondered, excuse me, if you knew the significance of why Jesus was dead for three days before he was resurrected. It's the same time period that Lazarus was apparently dead and then he was resurrected. Uh, what is the significance of the three days? Do you, do you know that one? Um, yes. Um, Jesus pointed out that as um, Jonah was in the wet belly of the, of the big fish for three days and three nights, so he would be in in the in the tomb for three days and three nights. So Jesus um, pointed to Old Testament prophecy as the reason for the um, the time period. Does anybody else have any other thoughts on that? Well. I, I've heard, and I may be wrong here, right, that um, in, in Jewish culture, like if somebody uh, wanted to, needed to be confirmed that he needs to be in, in the tomb for three days, and then they would confirm that he definitely died, right? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether, where it came from, but that's what I heard somewhere. Right? I still believe that. Yeah. Well, that's a good explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Kathy, have you found any other sources other than the Bible that talk about the resurrection of Jesus? That talk about the resurrection? Are you talking about ancient sources? Yes. Ancient sources, okay. <clears throat> Like Josephus, does he ever mention anything about the resurrection? Well, let me go down to what um, the sources that um, Lacona and Habermas cite. Um, they cite um, Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian, Marabar, Simbicero. I don't know if I can pronounce Serapion, his last name, and the Talmud. Um, they also quote Acts. They find Acts, Polycarp, Tertullian, Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Origen, and Dionysus of Corinth. Can you put that list on the, on the screen so we can see it? Can I put it on the screen so you can see it? Let me see it. I can do that. Share, you have to share a screen again. Okay. Um, share a screen. I am going to have to share my notes page. Share. <laughs> okay. Can you see at the bottom of the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Those are the sources that Habermas and Lacona site. So they cite five ancient sources to support <laughs> Jesus' death and that he arose and appeared to them. Incidentally, their book is humongous. It weighs a ton. And it goes through many of the challenges that Christians face from skeptics on why Jesus did not rise from the dead. And they address many of those challenges. For instance, a challenge might be that um, the disciples were hallucinating the resurrection appearances 
And so they go through challenges like that. Or the disciples stole the body. That's another challenge. And um, so I highly recommend that book. It weighs a ton, but it's really worth getting and looking at um, their arguments for the resurrection. Okay, can I stop sharing that now? Yeah. Okay. Chris, you have another question? Uh, yes, I, I was just wondering, There apparently there are there have been 230 predictions in the Old Testament about Jesus, about what would happen and what he, what he would do and all the rest of it. Uh, I'm just wondering, is that your understanding? Are you you're probably quite familiar with the various predictions that have come true? Do you have any comments on that? That was a compilation on um, Matthew's gospel. They went through and identified what were the Old Testament predictions about the Messiah or what were some inferences that they could that they could come up with from the Old Testament. Um, so um, those would be um, 130 Old Testament quotes and allusions in Matthew's gospel showing that Jesus was the promised Messiah. So that would be quotes or allusions. I know other people have tabulated the actual number of prophecies, but that would be a different number than what Matthew, these are quotes and allusions. Well, the second part of my question is, um, how does this work in your opinion? Like when prophecies are made, you know, 600 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years before the event, what, what, what is actually going on? Does God know the future somehow? Or does God actually make sure that these events occur? Uh, do you know anything about that? Um, yes, that would be part of my first presentation that you didn't get tonight, where we discovered the evidence from the universe for God's existence. And um, the evidence for the universe points to a creator who lies outside of the universe, that is outside of time, space, matter, energy, um, order, and um, information. So a creator who lies outside of the universe would have the power to enter the universe to um, talk to men and inspire the scriptures that we have, the Old Testament. And he would have the power to um, make those predictions well before they came true. So a creator who lives outside of the space-time manifold of the universe um, actually makes sense of the Old Testament prophecies. I, I'm wondering if that answers your question or if I'm off base on that. Well, it's a tough question because nobody really knows exactly what's going on, but... Um... I guess there's two ways of looking at it. One is that God lives in a two-dimensional time where he knows the past and the future just as well as he knows the present. It's all exactly the same thing to him. Of course, we only live in a one-dimensional time, so you know we barely know the present or the future. So from God's perspective, he knows the future because he can see it, it's there. Um, what I'm saying is that all these events seem to be happening because of the two-dimensional time, I don't think he programs everything to make sure every event happens. Because that's really, that's that's too much. I, uh, I think I agree with you on that. So let's not imagine God's time as a two-dimensional time line. Let's imagine that God's timeline is three-dimensional. And the best way that I can picture this would be a globe. And you have the equator the North and South Poles. Um, so a globe is three-dimensional. Let's put a two-dimensional timeline on the equator. And you and I 
actually are only on a one dimensional timeline on the equator. We can only go forward, we cannot go back. So we are a point on the equator. God, however, if he occupies three dimensions of time, um, just look at um, picture maybe the, the, the North Pole and on down to the equator. All of that would be God's dimension of time. And so God not only occupies a point in time well ahead of our points in time, um, but also well behind us. So God occupying three dimensions of time, you have no problem with him programming people to fulfill what he's written in the scriptures. Rather, you have a God that occupies the future and knows the future. And so because he knows the future, he's actually having his prophets in the Old Testament recording what that future will be like. It's very interesting. Thank you. I thought I heard Ross say there's 16 time dimensions. Okay. I can't go any farther than a globe. <laughs> With oh, I think there's uh, uh, the string theory, string theory. It's supposed to be 16 dimensions. I mean, yes, but uh, there's only three, two or three time dimensions. The other ones are spatial dimensions. Oh, spatial dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's three time dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I chime in there? Please do, Jim. Go ahead. Okay, because um, I'm just starting in um, my 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 learning in uh, in in the Hebrew, and if we if we look at if we look at truth, it's it's um, made up of Aleph, which is uh, beginning, Mem, which is medium, and Tall which is N and it's in it and all of them together as spiritual are, are, are one. It's a unified existence. Jim, do you have a question? To... Well, no, that's, 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 uh, I just wanted people's opinion on that. Cause I'm just, you know, I was just studying that and that, that explains, um, the 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 whole of 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 the spiritual because it's uh, in in the Greek it would be you know uh, alpha omega and I don't know what the middle one would be but in in the the original Hebrew it, it lays it out pretty pretty um, plainly. I, I don't think it's really relevant to tonight's topic though, Jim. <clears throat> um, I, I have a question, Kathy, if I may. Sure. When I've I've done a presentation on this um, several times, including to the chapter several times on the resurrection evidence for the resurrection, and I I certainly didn't do anywhere near the detail that you have done. So thank you for that. Um, one of the things I've run into in uh, with Christians is that there's a lot of confusion around this three day thing, and many Christians believe that Jesus was in the grave for three days, and by that they mean three 24 hour days. But my understanding is that any part of the day in in um, in, in Jewish culture uh, was a day, and you start counting on the first day. So the day Jesus died is day one. Um, the second day is the next day, and the third day is any you know as soon as you're a part of that third day. And so, it, when we say Jesus rose on the third day, it makes complete sense from a Jewish perspective. But if we insist on three days, then it's, it just doesn't work uh, because we know that Jesus died on on Shabbos um, <clears throat> on the Friday night or Friday afternoon of Shabbos. And therefore, you know, three days could not go by before um, the resurrection, three full 24 hour days. Is that your understanding as well? Or am I wrong on that? Yes, I, that's my understanding. I've also read where people are putting the um, crucifixion on a Thursday. Mm. and um, then they would count Thursday, Friday, Saturday and to Sunday. So um, I you know, I don't remember exactly who 
um, the scholars that are doing Thursday, but, but I have read that and um, you might research that, but sure. I, I, I tend to agree with you, Don, that it makes more sense that, um, that um, the Jewish culture, part of a day was considered a day. My, my understanding was that there was two Shabbats. There was a Shabbat of Passover and the Shabbat of the week. So there were two Shabbats, one right after the other. So depending on how you wanted to count it, it could be three days or, or whatever, right? I just thought I'd put that, because those are the scholars, they say there, there's two Shabbats at that same time, the Passover and the weekly Shabbat. The, yes, the Passover would be the evening of one day to the evening of the next. The, or a, a, a Sabbath would be a full, complete 24 hours. Yeah. Um, would be the evening of one day to the evening of the next. Yes. And I think Moses actually defines that in, um, in Leviticus, maybe chapter 22, verse 32, or 23, 32. I don't recall right offhand the the place where he defines that. Yeah, I, I'm not saying I got the answer. I'm just saying that's some argument that I heard. There were there, you got these two Shabbats overlapping there, and that can cause that, that maybe some of the why we have that discrepancy of what the day was, the three days. That that's a that's a thought too. Yes. Would you happen to know if? Uh, the word yom is used in that context. We're, we're familiar with the word yom because of uh, the periods of time and creation. But is the word yom used there as well? The New Testament would not have been written in Hebrew. Yom um, is a yom is a, a Hebrew word, right, so it was written in Greek. So we we would need to know the the Greek. If it includes more than you know more than twenty four hours, right? It, it could be a word that came from the word yom, meaning the same thing only in Greek, possibly. Possibly. Yeah, if you if you read the Hebrew translation, it would probably be yom, but yeah, whatever that means. Right? Yeah. But I guess, yes, of course, it's great. Okay. I have a question. Um, when Jesus was was on Earth, he had a body just like ours, which was, you know, relatively frail or fragile, and, and you know, all these bodies die, flesh, etc. But when he was resurrected, my understanding is that he was resurrected given a body which was eternal so that he would never change so if we saw him in a billion years he would actually look the same his body anyway would look the same as when he was resurrected do you uh can you comment on that um yes paul comments that um people are resurrected with it that people have that Animals have one kind of a body, fish have another kind of a body, people have another kind of a body. But when we're resurrected, our body will be different. This that mortality will put on immortality. And so I think you're really correct in saying that um, when we are resurrected, we will have a body that will be that won't have, you know, the problems that come with aging like like you see in me. Um so I, I really think I'm going to look forward to that kind of body. You know, I, I won't have a crackly voice that drives people crazy or a drippy nose or the other things. So I'm really looking forward to that. Now, the other resurrections that you read about in the Old Testament and the New Testament, those are resurrections like Lazarus. Lazarus had a, a resurrected body that would die again. Right, exactly. Jesus was the only one that was resurrected with a body that was immortal. And if you look at his appearances in, in the book of, of Acts, my goodness, his body could go through doors. Um, 
he could eat fish. His appearance um, at times on the road to Demaeus, the two disciples that were walking there didn't actually recognize him, only when he was giving grace for, for the bread and breaking it. And so this kind of a body um, that he had after he was resurrected was quite amazing. Thank you. Anybody online have any questions? Shay, do you have any questions? Or Caroline? No questions, thank you. I have a question. The hundreds that were resurrected from the dead, as far as uh, that must have been an allegory of meaning because um, we don't have any historical um, thing to back that up by Josephus or any of the others in, in, in recorded history. So I was wondering what people's comment was on that. Well, Josephus wrote a history of the Jewish nation, yeah. and um, he wrote it for the um, Caesar. And I imagine that he would have left out things like Old Testament resurrection when when the prophet um, raised. Um, I can't remember the daughter's name, the Shulamite daughter. Does anybody else remember the? The um, woman who was, or no, it was a son, woman's. Does anybody else remember that? So I don't think Josephus would have really, for an, for an emperor, would have been putting details from the Old Testament into his history like we have in the Old Testament. Yeah, there were three resurrections in the Old Testament and three, three in the New Testament, right? Um, Elijah raised... Uh, Elijah and Elisha both raised Elisha. You were saying the woman of Shun or whatever. Uh, and then in the New Testament, of course, you know, you've got Lazarus and name and but they, like you said, they they were raised, but they didn't have immortality when they were resurrected. I count uh, about six resurrections in the New Testament. Six. And uh, if you think that of Adam and being dead and then brought to life without breathing, there's four resurrections in the Old Testament. Well, okay, if you consider Adam, uh, where do you get six? My, my research is three. One. I have a list of them, but I don't have it with me. I know oh. there's uh, the, the boy that died at Nain. Yeah. There's uh, Jerry's daughter and Lazarus. Jerry's daughter, Lazarus. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, it says that when Jesus died, a lot of tombs open up and people were resurrected. Oh, yeah. And then in the okay. book of Acts, there's uh, Eutychus and Dorcas were resurrected. And uh, I forget who the other one is. Okay. Well, well when Jesus, yeah, uh, the tomb, the, 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 yeah, when Jesus passed uh, the way of whatever, uh, was died initially, yeah, the, tomb, the graves were open. But I, I guess I didn't count those as resurrections. And then there's a and future, that's future what I was saying. Was that is that an allegory? Because we have no history of that. Well, it, it's Jim. It's not uh, talk about in any uh, extra biblical record, but it is in the Bible. Yeah. I know it's uh, yeah. I know it's in the Bible, but I, but but I didn't. I I is it is it an allegory of, of, of all those people being raised in, 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 in some meaning, or is it because as you know, that many people, you, you would think there would be some sort of historical record of it. Um, no, as far as I know. Yeah. There's no identification of those individuals, like, like the other ones, Narius and, and all the rest of them. And Lazarus, those are people identified. Anyway, and I think it's worthwhile mentioning the Lazarus tomb, um, uh, allegedly authentic tomb, can be visited in Bethany still until today. And um, 
uh, apparently he moved after um, after uh, Jesus died to Cyprus, where traditionally there is a church where is his second tomb. Um, and I think the church, the church is called, called the Church of Lazarus as well. Oh. He and he was preaching over there. This is no, this right, is yeah. the tradition. Of yeah, 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 yeah. I'd like to go to Cyprus. Yeah. So and probably one of the reasons he ran away is because uh, a lot of the Jews wanted to kill him because yep. Jesus had raised him. They they wanted to destroy the evidence. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Which which is one more reason to to believe that Jesus authentically died and raised, right? Well, definitely that he died, right? So anyway, another confirmation. Well, if there are no other questions, maybe we'll uh, end the meeting a little bit early today. Can I ask you, Kathy? Can I ask one last question? Oh, go ahead. Chris has one more question. Um, you know, many people today uh, are not Christians because they assume that they live life today and they're supposed to enjoy life to full. When they die, they die. And that's it, period. They're not worried about the future or afterlife. They just live for the day and that's it. And yet in the Bible, and of course everything it teaches, it says that you have a soul or a spirit that lives on. And in all these cases of Jesus, Lazarus, and all that, your spirit comes back and it, it's them. It's exactly them. So your spirit hasn't died. So how can you sort of explain to these people out there that, that we have a spirit that lives whether our body dies or not? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. That is did you hear his question? Would you repeat the last part of your question? How can we explain what? Well, how can we explain to all these people in our society that they have a spirit and that their physical body may die, but their spirit lives, so they should be concerned about what happens to their spirit? Because um, in the Bible, all of these cases where people have died, they have a spirit that, you know, comes back to life, like Lazarus and, and, and Jairus and all the rest. I think what we need to do instead of explaining that is remind them that Jesus rose from the dead. And if you were a Christian, if he didn't raise from the, from the dead, then God is a liar. And life is not worth living. You just eat, drink, and be merry, like, like Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians. But because Jesus rose from the dead, there's hope for us. We don't end our lives when we die. There's hope. Um, there are eternal consequences for what we do with the evidence of Jesus' resurrection. There are consequences not only eternally, but in our life today. It makes a difference in how we live our life. Jesus rose from the dead. I have hope for the future. Today is, is just another wonderful day that he's given me to live and to share with, with other people who Jesus is. So if he rose from the dead, our faith is true and believable. And we have wonderful news to share with everybody. That's what the gospel creed is about. Those who believe it and receive it, it makes a difference in their lives. Yeah, but that's the that's the rub. Uh, intellectually, it's hard to do that because most people rely on their lean on their own understanding that it says in Proverbs, and and I'm blessed with the Holy Spirit that come into my life and revealed it to me. And unless the Holy Spirit does, you can talk to your blue in the face. To a humanist, and, and they're not gonna they're not gonna buy what we're selling. So you just hope for the best. You tell them the truth, and you hope the truth will enter their. You hope the Holy Spirit will enter the enter their their body, and that they will understand the truth and set them free. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. Like my own fat, a lot of my family members, you, you just you know you just tell them what the truth is, but but but. but 
our our way of like 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 this book can samples you know seven truths that gave the world and some of these truths are dangerous ideas to a humanist they just can't accept it it's they find it threatening but anyway i don't i i don't want to go, go off on a tangent but it's the holy spirit that convicts us yeah. and, and if, if they don't have the holy spirit you can't you can't logically explain that to them it doesn't make any sense to them to my own family it doesn't make sense they keep beating me down and says well where's the logic in that you know they just can't get it i agree that the resurrection is by far the best answer However, scientists have examined the human brain to try to find out what part of the brain contains consciousness and it can. So that lends itself to the idea of spirit. And right. There's sort of a physical proof. I think from these two questions, I can feel the, the tension in the air, the yearning that how do we actually share gospel, right? How do we because we, we've got something that the other people probably would like to have as well if they knew how good it is, right? This faith and, 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 and understanding the truth. But, but how do we do that? And I, I think that pitching the gospel is probably not the best thing or, or trying to logically prove that something is like this or like that. It, it's probably more telling the the truth story or telling your own experiences because people cannot falsify the experience. This is this is my story, right? Or my witnessing. This is how I came to, to believing in Christ. And also um, there is, um, we, we have to understand that there is uh, this information or out there, which is kind of being run over or actually underneath the spiritual world, right? Where um, there is there is like two uh, parties that are trying to make their point. Okay, this is the truth. Or I believe in it, right? And then the other party, which is we consider them nefarious or 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 devil, they are trying to um, uh, tell people the lie that no, this is not true, and and you just have to live your life. Uh, the best you can because this is all you have, right? And the question is, uh, yeah, how to how to convince people that what we believe is true is really true. And there is a lot of uh, real facts out there. Like there is uh, right now, there is a movie about uh, about the real exorcism taken while it is happening, right? How do you explain that, right? Um, uh, I think it's uh, the, the name, uh, the title is in the name of Jesus. Um, there is there is a ministry, it's more, you know, authentically um, uh, uh, releasing people from, from the bondage of, of, of evil, right? These things are happening and they are recorded in the books as well, right? Um, I would say the average uh, of people are not open to this, right? But there is a number of, of of things that are happening in people's life, probably more often than we think, that are supernatural. Um, and the science is telling, obviously, about the supernatural things like, um, uh, like Big Bang, right? Like uh, uh, emergence of life, like emergence of consciousness, right? Like like the big uh, cultural, uh, uh, the Big Bang uh, cultural in, in the civilizations, right? Uh, all of this put together a very strong uh, argument, right? But but still, I think to the average guy, you can talk through through the witnessing of your story or a narration of telling them the stories, right? Because because people are or humans are are created in such a way that the most convincing is the story, right? You tell your narration, your story about ordinary uh, the story about the, the, the Jesus, about the saints, about the apostles and, and ourselves. Well, I find the sacrificial nature of Christians, which is fundamentally different than any other religion or life, uh, life view, right? The sacrificial nature of Christians 
mystifies a lot of non-believers. And especially Jesus Christ, you know, dying on earth. That that there's no other guru that's done that. And and then you say, well, he resurrected. So I find that's the only hook that I can approach non-believers is that's the, the most uh, useful one that I find is that sacrificial nature that totally goes against human nature, survival of the fittest and all the rest of it. And so that catches them. The sacrificial nature of Christian generally. Why would why do you guys believe that? Someone, why would your leader die on like that, that just just that's what Buddhists can't get. That's what you know a lot of Hindus can't get. Like, a lot of Eastern religions they 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 find that very mystifying. And that's how I approach them with the self-sacrifice of nature of, of Christianity. And, and that's unique to us. Yeah. Well, I'd like to, to thank you for all of the answers you've given and your knowledge of the subject. I think you've really done a, a very, very good job of studying the subject. And, and I think your answers are bang on. So I, I, I appreciate what you've said. So. Thank you. So if uh, nobody else has any more questions, I think we'll end the meeting here. And uh, hopefully you guys can join us next month. And uh, next month we're going to watch uh, a video of uh, Ken Samples. Uh, one of the books that Ken Samples also wrote is Good called one. God Among Sages. Oh, comparing no, that's not uh, Jesus to other wise men in, in the pack and showing you know that, that he's not just another wise man, but he's actually God in the flesh. Yeah, and, and, and that differential of okay. uh, self-sacrificing and all those other guys out yeah, and never did that. Thanks, so, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Thank Thanks you very much. You're welcome. Been delightful being here. You have some deep thinkers. That's wonderful. How oh, right. big is your Chicago chapter, by the way? <laughs> What did you say? How, how big is it? She's the, one of the leaders of the Chicago. Well, I, you're, you're not in Chicago anymore, are you? We moved from Chicago to Minnesota, so we left the Chicago chapter behind. Oh, I see. And it's um, the church that it was meeting in um, is merging with another church, so we don't know what's going to happen to the Chicago chapter right now. Okay. If it will if they will have to find a new venue or if they will still be able to meet there. So that's kind of up in the air. So I know they've canceled next month's meeting and I don't know about the month after that. All right. I guess it's something we can pay for. Yes, yes please. Yes, we would appreciate that. Well, thank you. And we'll see you uh, next month when we're convicted. <laughs>